this series that we have called Proximity, where we're talking about getting closer to God. Is that the heart of this house? You might want to get closer to God. And so we're talking about getting closer to God by living a life of worship. And just so we're on the same page, I want to welcome anyone who's new for the first time. Just by definition, the word proximity means the quality or state of being near in space, time, or relationship. It means closeness. It also means how close you are to something or someone. Y'all ready today? Come on, elbow your neighbor and say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Y'all going to help me preach, right? We're going to have some fun today. This is going to be so good. I'm thankful for God's word. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, so I want us to look at the first attack on the Israelites, God's people, in Exodus chapter 17, after God led them out of slavery um, and let, take them, taking them to their promised land. And I, I want you, we're not going we're gonna, to we're gonna dive too much into it and, and really spend a lot of time there, but I want, I want you to pay attention on, on how what's going on in Israel today dates all the way back to the Bible. Understand what's going on in Israel is one of biblical proportion, y'all. And what I really want you to see today is how Israel prevailed in this battle in Exodus and how that still speaks to us today when it comes to proximity. Y'all ready? Listen, I truly believe this. Somebody is going to leave today different than the way you walked in, in Jesus' name. All right? Exodus 17, here we go. We're going to verses 8 through 16. Here's the story. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in, in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hand grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held, held, up, held, hands, held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. All right, if you're taking notes, write this down. The title of the message today is warfare weapons warfare weapons come on let's pray together and let's also pray for another church today father thank you so much for this beautiful day god in the great month of october lord thank you for this time of the year and with all the things that are lined up for the remaining of the year god we're we're, we're excited about what you have in store for us god thank you for this amazing church god thank you for those amazing people Lord, right here in this auditorium and joining us, joining us online. And Lord, we just take a moment right now and lift up another church to you. And Lord, this one's special to me. And I'm, I'm so thankful for this man of God in this church. And we lift up the First Baptist Church of Morristown. God, I'm thankful for Pastor Dean Hahn. And God, his heart for Israel is second to none. And, and I thank you for how you use him to reach your people in Israel. And I, I pray that you would bless this man of God. Strengthen him today with fresh anointing. God, with wisdom, Lord, favor. I pray you bless his family with life and good health. Lord, bless their finances. Lord, bless his coming and his going. Lord, you bless their staff today and, Lord, their leadership and their members and their attendees. And, God, I pray that you would open heaven over First Baptist today and let people get saved today. Lord, let people be healed today. God, let people be set free and encouraged. Lord, I pray that people that go to First Baptist today will leave different than the way they came. And, God, will you do that here today as well? All around the world, God, we're thankful to be a part of the church. So, Holy Spirit, have your way. Thank you for your word. Will you speak to us and challenge us? Lord, change us today in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say a big amen. 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 You may be seated. Warfare weapons. So I've been thinking a lot about worship during this month, how to live a life of worship. And, And I've been thinking how we actually use forms of worship in different areas of our everyday lives for different reasons. For example, like many of us throw our hands up in life out of frustration or desperation. If you were like me, I'm, I'm like on a four-week losing streak with my team. Um, and so like I've been walking around like this 
for like four weeks, and so some of y'all know what I'm talking about um, <laughs> in, in those games. And like, I don't, I bet maybe you throw your hands up when you're driving, hopefully not both at the same time, but like, or if you're a stoplight, this is like the Christian way to flip somebody off. You're like, yeah. right? That's, <laughs> some of y'all need to repent because we know what you're thinking. It's a way that we celebrated a game, right? Um, so some, of us, some of us have had to throw our hands up to show surrender to an officer. Hopefully not recently, but maybe sometime in your life you've had to do that. So it's crazy what those means in different settings. We'll clap our hands to celebrate something good or to show approval of what's being said or done. Again, at a ball game, a concert, or a lecture. We'll shout at a ball game to pump up the team or to intimidate the opponent. We'll shout as a sign of victory. We'll shout at a concert because you're so excited. Like, we'll even dance at weddings. Some of y'all are dancing for TikTok for the whole world to see and shouldn't be, but you do it anyways. And <laughs> Some of y'all are telling on yourself and how rhythmically challenged you are in doing all of it. Some of y'all have been dancing at the club. And what's crazy that all, all these things are forms of worship that mean something totally different depending on where it's directed. Isn't it something that just the change of scenery can change the meaning because of where it's directed and who it's directed to? Because in here, if you can lift your hands, it's worship by declaring victory over your enemy and surrendering to God's love and to God's will. Come on, anybody lift your hands today? And here, if you can clap, it's, it's worshiping, celebrating the goodness of God. It's worship that you approve of the faithfulness of God in your life. And here, if you can shout, it's worship by declaring victory over Satan. It's worship by celebrating the victory that you have in Jesus. In here, even if you have no rhythm, but you can dance, it's, it's worship celebrating the joy of the Lord in your life. And it's worship that's declaring the enemy is beneath you crazy because I feel like there's some people in the church that do more worshiping towards other idols than you do for God. <laughs> how, many, how many of y'all shouted yesterday at the TV at your living room God? Come on, I can say this because I will shout at the TV and I will shout at a coach, and I will shout at a player, I will shout at my team, I will throw my hands up in celebration or disgust, and I will do it with the best of them. Why can I say it? Because you ain't gonna out-shout me in here, you're not gonna out-praise me in here, you're not gonna out-clap me in here, because nobody and no thing can do for me what my God can do. Come on, can anybody in the house worship the Lord for a second? Can somebody clap your hands? Can, can somebody lift up your voice? Can, can somebody give God a big praise in the house because he's worthy today? Amen. It may be a little too early. I hadn't even got started yet. See, the heart behind this series is to get you to a place of worship in church so that you will live a life of worship in the world. Don't, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with enjoying all those things in the world as long as those things don't come before God. Don't give worship to something or someone, especially when you ain't going to worship God. Come on, somebody. Worship will change your proximity to God, and being close to God will forever change your life. And so today, let me give you three things that we can learn from Exodus chapter 17 that will help you adjust your proximity to God. Number one, write this down. Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. Worship is your weapon that weakens your your enemy. Let's look at it. Verse 9 through 11. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held, his, held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. Hey, Avenue, I am concerned that we get too comfortable in church today. 
We get way too comfortable and we come to church to spectate instead of participate. 8 o'clock and 11.30, nobody in the 9.30, I know. We get too concerned. Listen, this is the place where we do battle. And if worship is a weapon, it must mean that we are at war with someone or something. Now, in Exodus 17, the people of Israel are about to inherit a family feud. So let me just briefly, like you need to go back and read this for yourself, but briefly break down this story for you so it makes sense. In Genesis chapter 27, Jacob and Esau are brothers. They're sons of Isaac. And so Jacob took his brother Esau's blessing and birthright because Esau did not value it. And Esau never really got over that. And now the Amalekites are the descendants of Esau. Esau's grandson is Amalek, who raised up the Amalekites. And they're still upset that Jacob got the birthright. Now God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Moses is leading the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land because they've been in slavery. Long story where they end up meeting up with the Amalekites who were still upset that the Israelites received their birthright and the Amalekites are not happy about it. If you're good, say I'm good. Good. That's very, very brief, a long story. Esau hated Jacob because Jacob keeps getting what he wanted. The Israelites inherited this fight. Why am I telling you all this? I'm glad you want to know. Because you have also inherited a fight. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Come on, we talked about this last week, Avenue. We talked about it last week. We we, we talked about how Lucifer, he's an angel who was kicked out of heaven, Satan. He lost his position. Heaven was void. So God creates man to fill the void when Lucifer was cast out of heaven. And God replaces Lucifer with you. And he gives the favor to you instead of to Lucifer. Come on, understand it, church. You inherited this fight. Lucifer doesn't care who you are. Satan doesn't care who your family is. He doesn't care what your name is. All he cares about is your standing where he's supposed to be standing, doing what he was supposed to be doing, worshiping God. And just like the people of Israel, you inherited a fight today. And you're going to need a weapon called worship that will bring you close to God because when you're close to God, everything changes. And worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. Come on, touch your neighbor and tell him, learn to use your weapon. Learn to use your weapon. Are we good? Just laying a little groundwork here. So let's let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Warfare weapons. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It says, What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 through 16, just a little bit later on in this chapter. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those. Somebody say free. Free. Come on, somebody shout free. free. And free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. Come on, family, get this right here. You were supposed to be in bondage. You were supposed to be a slave to sin. You were supposed to be living a life defeated. And Satan wants you to stay that way. But can I park it today to tell you that some of the greatest worship that can be offered up to the Lord is the worship of freedom. Come on, worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. In other words, I was lost but now I'm found. I was bound, but now I'm free. I was blind, but now I see. Come on, am I talking to anybody in the house today? Is there anybody who can worship from a place of freedom that you still should be bound? I should be battling drugs. I should be battling alcohol. I should be battling depression. I should be battling pornography. I should be battling anxiety. But God sent his son and reached down into the mess of my life to save me and restore me and pick me up and turn me around. And because of the mercy of God, I'm free today. Come on, Avenue. There's a worship of freedom in the house because of Jesus. You have been set free. Come on, somebody give God a big shout of praise today. Come on, high five your whole area and tell them I worship because I'm free. I worship. I worship because I'm free. Come on online, 
Talk to me. I worship because I'm free. Woo! Are there any worshipers in the house today? We're, well, come on, don't, don't be freaked out. We're just adjusting our proximity to get us closer to God. So, so let's keep going here. Same chapter, chapter 2, Hebrews. Chapter 2, let's look at verse 16. It says, for it is clear that God does not reach out to help his angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you have become the seed of Abraham. You're a part of the family of God. And God's not running out to help the angels today. He makes it clear that when I call upon him, he comes to help me. And now Satan hates you because you have what he wanted. You inherited this fight. You got the power he wanted. You got the authority he wanted. Come on, your worship reminds the devil of what he lost. Y'all better talk to me. Avenue, your, your worship reminds the devil of what he lost. Whenever you worship God, you're reminding the devil, this used to be your job, big boy, but you lost it. Now I'm going to worship God, and he's going to run to help me. Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. I got the favor he wanted. I got the power he wanted. I got the authority he wanted. That's why he hates the worship part of the service. That's why he hates it when you worship, because worship reminds him of what he lost. That's why the devil fights the worship part of the service. That's why, that's why worship, that's why the worship part of the service is the hardest for you to get to. On time. Hear me. Even the devil knows the word of God. Even the demons know the word of God, but demons do not worship God. That's why he tries to keep you out of the worship part of the service. Come on, I'm gonna preach this thing today because when you get in here, worship reminds you of who you are. It reminds Satan of who he is and what he lost. It reminds you of who God is. Oh, I wish somebody came to worship today. I wish somebody would give hell a fit today. Come on, somebody. Throw your hands up in worship. Somebody shout to God in worship. Somebody step into battle and warfare with worship. Somebody remind the devil, you don't have the authority. I've got the power over your ability. Come on, somebody change your proximity and just worship today. Oh, now would be a good time for about a 15 second praise break and just worship God and to remind the devil that he can leave Come on, somebody give God a big shout of praise today. Woo! Oh, you're not done yet. You're not done yet. You're not done yet. Come on, somebody use your worship to remind all of hell that he has no power over you. He has no ability over you. Come on, somebody worship your way to victory today. Woo! I need you to find four people and tell them your worship changes everything. Your worship, your worship changes everything. Your worship, your worship changes everything. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. Hey, you knowing that, your praise should never be silent anymore. I tell you that, and more than half the room, amen. Next week. Take us 45 minutes to get you to yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. seven days pass. <laughs> well, there's a reason, Pastor. Well, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I got, I got to get all this in. It's 1029. 
Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. Let's keep going here. There's two more things you need to understand. Number two, write this down. People who are close to God are engaged in worship. People who are close to God are engaged in worship. Don't tell me you're close to God and you don't worship. If, if, you say, if you say that you're close to God and you don't worship, there's a Greek word. That's, uh, it's a really good gr- Greek word. <laughs> two. Well, I'll put back to one. No, two. Two. Bull crap. <laughs> That's Greek. People who are close to God are engaged in worship. Verse 11, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Can, can I tell you something that irritates the fire out of me? I mean, irritates me to no ends. Here's something that irritates me. Pastors and leaders who are not engaged in worship. You know what I'm talking about. They got, they got their holy throne over here. And... Like, I, don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand it when I see this. Pastors who sit behind some wall or in a room and then make their grand entrance after the worship part of the service. Well, the, 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 anoint, the, the, the atmosphere is just not conducive to my anointing. Well, that's a weak anointing. A pastor should come out and set the atmosphere. Pastors are the primary worship leaders in the church. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is not so I can toot my own horn. It's just I want to give you scripture and word today. Is that all right? As a pastor, it is my duty and responsibility to set the atmosphere. I don't depend on somebody else to set it for me. God has called worship leaders to lead from the stage, but God has called pastors to lead worship from the crowd. The worship team leads us every week in worship. And as a pastor, I have a calling to get engaged, to engage and lead you from that spot right there. And as a pastor, I cannot become so occupied with what I've been called to do, which is preach, that I lose sight of what I've been created to do, which is worship. Come on, talk to me, church. Before I'm called to preach, I am created to worship. That's why I don't care if y'all stare at me. I will always be up here worshiping because it's not my job to wait for you. It's my job to start this party right there from the front row. So Moses took it to the top. Watch. Moses, Moses wasn't a micromanager. He learned that from his father-in-law, Japheth, who says, don't be a micromanager. Moses took it to the top, and he told, he told the warriors to go fight because he had a job to do. Can I tell you another thing that drives me crazy? I'm going to tell you. So caught. If, you're a, if you call yourself a Christian, wave your hand at me. Just, you call, okay, here's what irritates me. So-called Christians, you're so-called, you called yourself Christian. So-called Christians who are not engaged in worship. <laughs> like, I couldn't get you to clap your hands if I gave you $500. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, th- this is like the part of the service, I, I, every service, I will find a place to offend somebody. I promise you, it's one of my spiritual gifts. Drives me crazy, so-called Christians who are not engaged in worship. Well, look at the pastor. If he was going through some of the stuff that I've been through this week, he'd be sitting back here just like me. Well, I don't mean to be rude, honey, but it's time for you to stop living by the emotion of the moment and start living by the truth of God's word. Sometimes I don't feel like it. Sometimes I don't feel like worshiping. But regardless of what my emotions are telling me and regardless of what my feelings are telling me and regardless of what reality is telling me, I know a God who is good. Come on, church. Your current condition is only temporary and your worship will determine whether you move forward in victory or if you remain 
remain stuck in defeat. You've got to learn to grow up a little and learn to worship your way through the storm. Because until you learn what God wants to teach you, you'll never go where God wants to take you. So Moses went to the top and he raised his hands so everyone can see that this battle is not yours. It belongs to God. Your ability won't win it. Your strength won't win it. But you let God get involved and he will give you victory. Come on, somebody shout a big amen right there. Come on, high five two people and tell them worship your way through it. Worship, worship your way through it. Worship your way through it. Well, pastor, it's just not my style to do that. That's all right. Stay stuck right where you are. I'll take my blessing and yours. I'll get my breakthrough and yours. Moses, Moses was showing them, God's got this. There was a, there was a time I took, Melissa and I took our kids to a, I don't know if it's still there, it's like a safari ranch over here in Morristown area, and they, they put you on this like truck, jeep type thing, and they take you through this these woods and this forest, and there's all kinds of, there's like ostrich and buffalo and all kinds of stuff. And Melissa was pregnant with Judah, and Jocelyn was real little, and she don't, she don't remember this, but she's real little. And this was rough riding, y'all. Let the rough riders roll. Oh. <laughs> if you know, you know. If you don't, don't worry about it. Stop. Drop. No, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> it, was rough, it was rough riding that day, and I'll be honest, I was a little nervous because Melissa's pregnant, and I'm thinking, man, I, this baby's got to stay inside of her today because she, she was very pregnant, and it was not, it was not I was kind of worried. And so I'm telling myself, don't show, show my expression on my face because Jocelyn's little, and she was kind of like, whoa, what, what y'all brought me to today? And she was a little nervous, and I noticed she kept on looking at me. She, she wanted to see me. There's a reason why she wanted to see me. She was looking to see my reaction. Why do they want to see me? Because they know I've, I've been through life long enough. And if this isn't scaring dad, then they know that they've got nothing to be afraid of. If dad's taking it easy, then she knows she's going to be okay. Newsflash. Again, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just trying to get in my date today my gate today. Newsflash, when you come into this church and you see this pastor lifting his hands, let that be a testimony to you that everything's going to be all right. I've come to let the avenue know God's got this. He's got everything under control. Your job is to adjust your proximity and worship because he is Jehovah Nisi. He is your victory. Come on. I need you to find three people and tell them you praise and let God fight. You praise and let God fight. I know it feels like you're about to lose your mind, but you praise and let God fight. I know it feels like tomorrow will never come, but you praise and let God fight. I know it feels like your family may be falling apart, but you praise and let God fight. You're not hearing me today. I know it feels like you're all alone in this thing, but you praise and let God fight. Come on, touch your neighbor and tell them you praise and let God fight. You praise and let God fight. And when God fights, you will be victorious. He is your banner of victory. Oh, I wish I could find somebody in this house who would send all of hell into confusion. Lift up a praise that gets God's attention. Come on, you praise and let God fight. Woo! Come on, high five your whole zip code and tell them there's victory in your worship. There's victory. There's victory in your worship. There's victory, there's victory, there's victory in your worship. If y'all push me just a little bit, I'm afraid I'm losing my voice just a little bit. If you'll help me out. Y'all hear me okay? Well, Pastor, stop shouting so loud. Well, I don't want to. There's victory in your worship. Psalm 22, verse 3. God inhabits the praises of his people. Come on, when you praise God, he shows up. 
Psalm 149, 6 through 7 says, May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. Worship is your weapon that weakens your enemy. People who are close to God are engaged in worship. So when 9.30 shows up this time next week, it's not going to take you an hour to get warmed up before there's ever a pep in your step. Come on. We're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Amen, somebody. Here's the third one. I'm done. Number three. Write this down. People who are close to God are engaged in the word. It's where half the room checks out right here. People who are close to God are engaged in the word. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Can I tell you one more thing that drives me bananas? So-called worshipers, and I'm not talking about the people with the microphone. And I'm not just talking about the people with the instruments. I'm talking about us. Something that drives me nuts are so-called worshipers who are not engaged in the word. What do you mean, Pastor? People who want to shout with the best of them during worship, but then check, up, go, check out, go to the bathroom three times, and fall asleep during the word. Fall asleep. I'll throw something at you. I will throw something at you. You may be falling asleep at the church down the road, but you ain't going to fall asleep in here. Come on, you're supposed to be a worshiper, and a worshiper should be engaged in the word. These worshipers didn't say, well, we, 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 these warriors didn't say, well, we got down here first, we fought, did our part, let Moses do the rest. No, no, the Israelites understood that how they were fighting was directly connected to what Moses was doing. They understood that what Moses was doing was giving them power to defeat their enemy. Come on, church. Just because you stop singing during the worship portion of the service doesn't mean you stop worshiping. And it doesn't mean that you disengage from the word. You don't think this battle's over just because you did your part. Don't, don't you know that those warriors were pumped up when they looked up and they saw their pastor, Moses, holding up that rod? Read, your, read the story. He, he, he went up to the top. He had that rod in his hands. Oh, I love this so much. They would have looked up and saw that rod and said, hold up. I, I've, seen, I've seen that rod before. We, we, we've, we've seen that before. That's the same rod that he used to strike that rock and, and water poured out. That, that's the same rod that he lifted up in the air and, and, and the Red Sea parted. We've seen that rod before. And we know that if God was with us then, he will be with us now. So let me testify to somebody today. And let me declare God's word over your life. God's got you covered. The battle you're facing in life right now, it's not yours, honey. That battle belongs to God. Yeah, but pastor. My life is giving me fits and my family is putting me through hell and my life seems to be falling apart. And I've come to tell you that battle belongs to God. I've been in a battle before and there's one thing I know for sure. Our God is faithful. And if he showed up before, he will do it again. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. Whenever their pastor, whenever Moses... Lifted up that rod, the people are prevailing. The warriors would have rejoiced to see what's in the hand of their pastor. Whenever he's holding up the rod of the Lord, the people are prevailing. In other words, whenever there is a pastor holding up the word of God and preceded by worship, there will be people prevailing and the enemy will be defeated. Psalm 119, 105, for the word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, for the word of 
of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any double-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Listen, you may not always like the rod, and it may sometimes make you uncomfortable. Sometimes it will challenge you, and at times it will provoke you and even tick you off. But as long as there is a man or a woman of God holding up the word of the Lord, the people will prevail and the enemy will be defeated. Come on. If you're thankful for the word of God, give God a big shout of praise today. Woo! Come on, high five somebody and tell them you need the word. You need the word. You need the word. Sit down real quick. Sit down. I've got to get further than I did at 8 o'clock. I've got to share something with you. In Nehemiah chapter 8, 5 through 6, worship didn't even start until the word was brought out. Read it for yourself. They responded with praise and worship after the word of the Lord was declared. Don't misunderstand me. I love worship. I I love it. I love love worship. But it concerns me. When all we want to do as Christians is run to worship conference after worship conference with no word. It, It concerns me when we have people in this house who have an amazing playlist of worship and they worship all week long. word in your life newsflash the last time I checked it's the word that tells you who you're worshiping how can we have balance when there's all worship and no word it's the worship that tells us about the power of our worship our worship is a weapon our praise is a weapon we are loaded up with artillery of praise and worship. You can have yourself a fiesta right in the middle of the enemy's camp, but you've got to remember something. You might have a tank loaded with artillery, but without the word, you've got no gas to run that vehicle. If you have no word, you're not driving that tank anywhere. It's the word of the Lord that's given you power to your worship to defeat the enemy of your faith. Here's the big idea, and I'm not done. Your worship and God's word are the weapons that will bring you close to God and defeat your enemy. Adjust your proximity so you will live victorious. If you will leave this place and combine your worship with some word in your life, everything will change for you. Not just reading it, living it. Yeah, stand with me. This is the time to check out. This is the time to to press in right here because I know God wants to do something right here. Verse 11 through 13, while Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. So his hands remained steady until the suns went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. His hands showed a dependence on God to give them victory. Hands up, they were winning. Hands down, they were losing. Come on, Avenue. When you get into the house of God, worship equals winning. But but here's the deal. Moses' hand... That battle wasn't over just like, I mean, think about how long this battle could have lasted. We don't really know. His hands got tired. Let's just keep it real today. You come into church and sometimes your hands are tired. Not not just physical. I'm talking about spiritual. Sometimes you get tired. Sometimes you've fought all week, 
I'll talk about myself. It's easier that way. Sometimes my praise gets tired. Like I've given all, all, all I've got. I fought all week. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I've even thought, is my worship doing anything? My praise gets tired. I know I'm talking to somebody today. So sometimes it seems like the harder you fight, the worse it gets. Then Sunday comes around and you contemplate if you should even show up to church or not. Why should I even go? I'm exhausted. Come on, I feel this thing today. This is why we do what we do. This is why there's worship in the service. When you don't feel like praising God, if you'll get around some people who will say, you may be tired, I know you've fought all week, but I've got enough strength to share with you because at the avenue, we are stronger together. We're here to help you lift your hands and you get around some people who will help you use your weapons. And before you know it, your joy is coming back. And before you know it, your strength is coming back. And before you know it, your praise is coming back. Because if you can get your hands up, if you can worship, your whole proximity changes. Come on, church. If you're here today, And you'd say, Pastor, I need victory in a certain area of my life, but I just feel tired. And I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. You've got to use your weapons today and stand on God's word and start worshiping. Come on, if I'm talking to you, if you're here, but your spirit man is tired, why don't you do what Moses did and throw your hands up all over this house today? Come on, there's hands, yeah, there's hands, there's hands. Now listen, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Everybody else, look around you. If you're standing next to somebody who has their hands up in the air, even if your hands are in the air, I want you to grab their arm. I want you to grab their hand. Come on, all over this house. Nobody's standing alone. But if your hands are up, come on, church, rally around them and lift their hands. Come on. Some of y'all need to move out of your seat and find some people with their hands up in the air and just help them lift today. Come on, church. Find somebody, find somebody, find somebody. Let them give you the assurance that God's in control. He's going to give you the victory. Come on. This is why we exist today. Come on, somebody use your weapon. Come on, let's worship right here. Come on, with your hands lifted. Hey. the room. Put your hands down a second. Psalm 134. Now praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stands in the Lord's house at night. Lift up your hands in the holy place and praise the Lord. Watch. May the Lord maker of heaven and earth bless you from Zion wait 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 wait. when when praises go up God's blessings come down here's what I need you to see when you bless the Lord from this house God blesses you from his house Let, let, let let me end with this story I promise you I'm done I promise you, I promise you I'm done. 
Stay where you are. Don't, don't, don't check out. Let, let me end this story with David and Goliath real quick. Just read, it, read it for yourself. But the Philistines were constantly causing problems for the Israelites. Constantly threatening them. And, and the Bible says that down in the valley of Elah, there was a champion, Goliath, a giant, Goliath. Meaning the man, his name is the man of the middle, a, a great warrior. And he said to the Israelites, choose a man to fight me. It's more than just that statement. He thought he was saying that to Israel. He didn't realize that he was speaking to God. In other words, the giant, the problem in your valley today is challenging your God. Saying, choose somebody to fight me. The rest of the army over there has sat down. They've stopped trying. And they think all, all they can think about is what was. I've already taken their praise. I've already taken their fight. Goliath was saying, who are you going to send to fight me? And God puts his hand on David. Wait, wait. I love how God didn't go and get some trained warrior. God found a shepherd boy who was good at one thing. David would sit on the hills of Bethlehem and play his harp and worship. He would worship and drive out demons. And God says, get me somebody with a praise. Get me somebody who will praise me. I'll put them down in that valley. Watch this. If God would have sent a warrior down there, a warrior's job is to size up its enemy. And a warrior would have come to the conclusion that this guy is bigger than me. A warrior would have calculated that this giant is too big for them to fight. When God looked for someone to confront the champion in the valley, he did not go for a warrior. He went looking for a worshiper. Newsflash. A worshiper does not calculate the size of their enemy. A worshiper calculates the size of their God. It was David who said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name forever. In other words, stop Hey, stop sizing up your enemy and stop si start sizing up your God. A worshiper will get down in the valley and a worshiper faces their problem and says, I know that you're big, but let me tell you about my God. My God sits encircled on the earth. His, he his throne is heaven. His earth is his footstool. Who are you compared to my God? I've come to tell somebody today, stop telling God, oh, how big your problem is and start telling your problem how big your God is start speaking and declaring to your problems and your situation that my God is able to save and my God is able to heal and my God is able to provide and my God is able to set free come on get this Avenue it's not about the weapon in your hand it's all about the worship in your heart it's, it's not about the weapon in your hand it's the worship in your heart. Come on, Avenue. Don't let the devil steal your victory because you decided to silence your voice. How are you going to walk out here different the way you came in if you don't worship? How are you going to overcome the situation if you don't worship? If you were just with somebody with their hands up in the air and you were helping them and you were being an errand and a her to their life today, I want you to go to them again. I don't, I don't care who it was. I don't care if you're married to them, regret being married to them, have kids with them, your friends with them, you don't like them anymore. I don't care who it was. 
I want you to grab them by the hand and say, let's go. I want you to get down this altar because somebody's getting their praise back today. Somebody's getting their joy back today. Somebody's getting their peace back today. Somebody's about to step into a breakthrough today. Come on, come on, get them down here. As you get down here, throw your hands up in the air. Come on. Come on, lift your worship. Use your weapon today. I gotta get you out of here. But I'm telling you, there's a there's a breakthrough in the room. There's a breakthrough anointing in the room today. There is a breakthrough anointing in the room today. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but if you're this may not be for everybody, it may be for one person. But if you need a breakthrough in your life, I wish you'd lift up your worship to God right now and worship your way through it. Worship your way through it. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Come on, church. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. I don't know what each of you are dealing with on a personal level. In other words, I don't know why every person came to this altar today. The good news is I don't have to. God already does. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm not just saying this because it sounds good. But somebody, somebody's leaving different today. You're, leave, you're leaving different. You're leaving. I need... You're leaving different, bro. You're leaving different. Hey. Don't, don't let the enemy steal your victory because you decided to silence your voice. So I'm gonna count, hey, he can take my money, He can take my house. He can take my clothes. 
He can have all my shoes. He can have everything in my life. But as long as I have my praise, as long as I have a worship in my heart and a praise in my mouth, I've got more than enough to get it all back and then some. So I want to count to three. Hey, don't you dare. Don't you dare keep your voice silent. That is your weapon. I'm going to count to three. There's, there, there's one thing the devil cannot have. He cannot have my hallelujah. I'm going to count to three. And I don't know what you came in here with. But I know there's some people that need a breakthrough in some areas. And your praise is about to send you through. And on the count of three, I want you to shout hallelujah as loud as you possibly can. Because there's victory in your praise today. Hallelujah is your highest. It's, it's, it's your biggest. It's universal. Everybody knows it. And your praise is about to bring you victory and give you a breakthrough today. Come on, somebody's leaving different than the way you came. One, come on, I don't know what it is. But I want you to send all of hell running today. I want you to send chaos into all of hell. And I want you to get heaven's attention with your praise today. Come on, two. Come on, I don't know what it is. But God is able. And He's strong. And He's mighty. And He's more than able to do immeasurably more. Come on, Avenue. Three. got to get you out of here because our parking team's about to have a fit. Before we, before we leave, do, do me a favor. Just right there where you're standing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No, no one leaving, no one moving. Just our prayer team, just real quick. If you're here today and you may feel like, man, you may feel hopeless you may be far, you may be far from God. You, you may have never had a relationship with God. Or maybe you find yourself today disconnected from God. And maybe, maybe today you just need to reconnect. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ. I'm, I'm going to count to three. Come on, this, this, when I'm saying somebody's life is about to change, this is what I'm talking about. Like somebody's about to leave here different. I want, to, I want to pray. If that's you, I want to pray with you. Just right there where you're standing. Maybe somebody with us online as well. But if you need God, whether you've never had that relationship or maybe you've disconnected today, you need to recommit your life to Christ. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, just slip that hand up just so I know who I'm praying with. All over this house. One, two, three. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, keep that hand up. Yeah. Thank you. 
Praise God. Somebody online, let our team know. Come on, if you lifted that hand, I want you to pray this from your heart and from your mouth. I want you to say, God, I need you. I'm lost without you. I give my life to you because you gave yours for me. You lived and died and you rose again. And today, I confess, Jesus, you are Lord. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And from this day forward, I'm not running from you. I'm running to you. Because you are my joy. You are my peace. You are my strength. And you are my salvation. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name. Come on, Avenue, one more time. Give God a big praise in the house. Hallelujah. If this message spoke to you today and you took your next step of making a decision to know Christ, we want to celebrate with you and walk this out with you. Simply click the link in the comments below and a pastor will reach out to you and celebrate the greatest decision you have ever made. At The Avenue, we know that we're stronger together, everyone matters, and you belong here.